Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 80 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. This week sees the return of our questions and answers, so stay tuned for my thoughts on dummying down a brood box, leaving queen excluders in place over winter, and the price of honey. Beekeeping Short and Sweet beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. So before we get started, I have to say what a scorching week we've had. We've been hit with another mini heat wave here in the UK, with the hottest ever recorded August bank holiday temperatures of around 33 degrees centigrade. So much for my prediction a few podcasts ago that we've had the last of this year's heat waves Best I stick to beekeeping and not weather forecasting, I think. So let's get straight into today's questions as we have quite a few this time round. And first up comes from Lisa McKenzie, who says, Hi Stuart, Patreon Lisa here. I'm a little confused. I'm sure I've read somewhere that to set up for winter to help reduce the space the bees need to keep warm, it's acceptable to reduce the number of frames in the brood box to just those containing brood keeping the frames in the middle with dummy boards for warmth, i.e. not having them on a cold outside wall. So if there's five frames of brood, you remove the other six frames. But if those six frames contain stores, won't they be needing these? Or even if they were empty, I would assume that the bees would fill these six frames with sugar syrup or fondant. So why take them out? I appreciate that As the queen stops laying, those brood-filled frames will become empty and available for stores, but leaving only five, for example, is not very much. Or is it okay to do if you intend to feed as necessary? If this is a done thing, when would you start to remove the frames? I hope that makes sense. Warm regards, Lisa. Well, hi Lisa, and thank you for the first question of this session. It's a really great question, and one I'm sure many beginner beekeepers in particular struggle with at this time of the year. Many beginner beekeepers, having nursed their bees through the season, dealt with swarms, maybe removed a few pests and finally taken a small honey crop from the colony, now dread the thought of trying to get these bees through the winter and of course the myriad amount of information that's out there that suggests all sorts of different methods. Your question though relates specifically to a process called dummying down. That is to say, using dummy boards placed either side of the brood nest to confine the bees into that space. The dummy boards give an impression of the end of the hive area and the bees will generally stay on the nest side of the dummy board. This is a really useful method of controlling the nest space when you're perhaps introducing a small nuke into a full-sized hive and used to persuade them to draw out one frame of foundation at a time. That's the usual time that I've used this method. If you Give a small nuke, maybe a three or four framed nuke, a full brood box to draw out. It can sometimes get a little disjointed and messy. So keeping them secure between a couple of dummy boards at each end helps them gradually build the colony without having too much space to manage. But your question, Lisa, refers to winter use of dummy boards to isolate the brood nest, the area where all of the brood is located. And to do this, would rob the colony of any food stores it has gathered in the brood box and would no doubt lead to them starving. The cluster of bees going into the winter and throughout the colder months is a very fluid thing. It moves around the brood box, accessing food stores as it goes, and if you put a solid board in the way, they'll not go round it but simply stay put and starve. And of course, if you've removed the frames of food, there's nothing there for them anyway. So I would definitely not use any dummy boards in the brood box over winter and leave all of the frames they have in place filled with food stores ready for them to use over the coming winter. And of course, if you're feeding them, then they will fill up any spare space that they have with sugar syrup. Next up are some questions from Janet McMahon, who writes, Hi Stuart, I have a hive that is in the middle of supersedure. The queen is gone and there are four sealed queen cells which I have been advised to leave as swarming is unlikely. Well, I hope so. Can I treat with Apigard, or do I have to wait until she's back and laying? The second question 
is also I was at a talk last week and the advice of the lecturer was the Apivar strips, such as you use in your nuke, is a hard drug and should not be used every year as it can contaminate the wax. Instead, Varroa treatments should be varied. What are your thoughts on this and do you alternate? And finally, I'm reading more and more that the current thinking is to start each year with fresh drawn out foundation in the brood box. It's like having new sheets, as one beekeeper proclaimed. What do you think? Well, hi, Janet. There's some excellent questions here, so let's get straight into them. Your first question regarding treating colonies with Apigard while having sealed queen cells in the colony is an interesting one. Over the years, I've tried my best to avoid treating colonies while there is a changing of the queen happening. It always seems to me that there's a risk that any introduced treatments could adversely affect developing queens within the sealed queen cells. The exception to this might be oxalic acid treatments, as these don't penetrate the sealed cells, and is why we use it during a broodless period. But I'm guessing that you also have sealed worker brood in the colony, so oxalic acid would be ineffective anyway. All that said, I have just this last week discovered in one of our mating nukes two queens. One a supersedure queen, and yes, you've guessed it, all happening while I'm treating with Apivar. The nuke has eggs and brood in all stages, and either I got lucky or the treatment hasn't affected the queen development in the cell on this occasion. Your second question, which coincidentally talks of apivar treatments, residue in the wax and the rotation of treatments. Yes, I do alternate treatments with the exception of oxalic acid, which I use most winters. But better still, and this incorporates your third question, I remove and replace older wax on a regular basis each spring, hopefully reducing any build-up of not just residue, but also any pests and diseases that may be present. I think it's an important part of any beekeeper's strategy for maintaining healthy stocks, and I've also used the Shook Swarm method of frame replacement to completely change an entire brood box of wax, and it is, as you say, the feeling of satisfaction of clean sheets or perhaps new socks they always feel quite good too don't they anyway on to the next question henry cheese writes newbie question coming right up can you put too many resources in the hive when you overwinter will the bees stop feeding when they have had enough or can overeating make them unwell cheers well hi henry and thanks for the question and despite what you say it's not a newbie question at all. I've seen beekeepers of some years' experience get to autumn feeding horribly wrong, and I've occasionally mistimed feeding the bees myself. And it's all about the timing rather than overfeeding. If you fill the brood box with syrup too early, you can end up reducing the available space the queen has to lay eggs in. The brood nest shrinks, and the bees can swarm, even in late summer. But more importantly, with a reduced brood area, you'll end up with fewer bees emerging just when the colony is heading into winter and needing every single worker to maintain the cluster temperature in order to survive. I would rather have too much syrup stored and see a frugal colony come through the winter easily than not enough and starve out in February. As for overeating and becoming unwell, we do find fat bees in the colony over winter, but that's more to do with survival than greed. I don't think I've ever seen an unwell bee due to excessive eating. Which reminds me, I must get back on my bike and do some more exercise. Moving swiftly on, Phil Rogers asks, What do you treat your super frames with to keep greater wax moth and lesser wax moth at bay? B401, which is probably quite pricey for the size of your operation, or acetic acid? Cheers, Phil. Well, hi, Phil, and thanks for that question. I'm pleased to say it's a simple answer for a change, as I don't treat my supers at all to protect them from wax moth, and I never have. It's something I've never felt a need to do, and my setup seems to work without any problems at all. So this is what I do. Once the supers have been extracted, they go back on the hives where the bees clean them out spotlessly, in most cases, that is. Sometimes they'll take all of the residual honey and restore it in the middle frame, in which case I remove that one frame from the box. Once cleaned out and what I would term dry, the supers get stacked in the apiary on a pallet with a travel screen mesh beneath the stack and a roof on top. That helps with the airflow through the stack. They stay here all winter 
and are ready again for use in spring, and I've never had any wax moth problems in any of the stacks. I did once have a rat attack the bottom super and get in and destroy a stack of about eight supers of drawn comb, but other than that one occasion, it's worked out fine for me. Fran Barham has several questions for us this month, and Fran writes, I have extracted some lovely honey this August and have put the supers back on the hive to be cleaned out. Never sure how long to leave these on and what the structure should be underneath them. Do you put them above the crime boards? I didn't, and of course found them full of bees the next day. Well, hi Fran. Nice that you've been able to extract some honey this August, and when putting the wet supers back on the hive, they need to go above the crime board. The separation from the brood box encourages the bees to clean out the super and take the honey down into the nest area rather than storing it again in the super. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, they will store it in one of the central frames, but normally they'll take it all down. Fran's next question is also about supers. I've been frugal with comb and kept the same wax in the frames over the last two years. Should I remove this comb now, or is it healthy enough to keep using it for next year? Some of the comb got messed up during the extraction, so obviously we'll need to replace those ones. So Fran, I like to change it out regularly, and as I use unwired foundation in all of my super frames, it's an easy process. I simply cut it out and melt it down in my Appy Melter warming cabinet. It's easy to forget that pests and diseases can be harboured in super frames, and I think it's good management to replace it on a regular basis. Thinking back of what I've got currently, I don't think we have any comb in the supers that's more than three years old, and that to me seems like a good place to start. And if you like making candles, or you want to have a go at making your own foundation, then cutting it out every year would make sense, and I think that would be perfect. Yes, you'll lose some honey production, but you'll have far healthier bees and much cleaner wax. So what I would say is, yes, you could probably go for another season with the comb that you've got, but if you could use the wax and you're not talking about too many frames, then why not cut it out and start afresh next year? And Fran's last question is, any advice on whether to invest in a solar wax melter or something similar? I only have three or four hives, so that doesn't yield a huge amount of wax, but I would love to keep it anyway. I have found heating up wax in pots to be a bit messy and arduous and want to know the easy hacks for this job. So, friend, the best hack that I've seen and actually tried is to make a solar wax melter using a double glazed glass unit set on top of a deep metal tray with a chicken wire sieve at the bottom to hold back all of the crud. A hole drilled through the tray at the bottom lets the molten wax out and it was all lined with tin foil that could be lifted out at the end of the process. Angle this in the back garden towards the sun and you have a solar wax melter. There are lots of kits out there as well that you could use to make up your own but this worked out quite well for the smaller amounts of wax that I was getting. If you're thinking of replacing comb on a more regular basis then perhaps something more permanent would be a better option. The other part of the solar wax melter was that it was all mounted in a wooden box with insulation beneath it, so it kept it really warm. If you take a look online, I'm sure you'll find lots of plans for DIY solar wax melters too, and it's always worth having a quick scan to see what you can find. Russ Clifford asks a couple of questions. I notice a lot of people have already started to treat for Varroa. If there's no evidence of Varroa in the hive, is it worth doing just in case, or does everyone do a mite check before deciding to go ahead? Well, hi Russ, and I always start treating in August as most late summer treatments take between six to ten weeks, and it's important to ensure workers produced during this time are as healthy as possible, with plenty of internal fat bodies to help them through the winter. I would suggest that as far as checking for mites prior to treating, there are those who do one or the other. Either they decide to treat only those that have a mite drop, or those who treat an entire apiary. This year, for instance, I've fallen into the latter camp, treating all colonies in each apiary with apivar. So Russ's second question. Long story short, but my main hive does not want to keep a queen and appears to be dying out due to no new bees being produced. The original queen disappeared. The two new virgin queens they produced didn't come back from their mating flights. 
and the new mated queen we introduced seems to have disappeared too. Is this normal behaviour for a hive in trouble? Just a run of bad luck? Or could something else be contributing to the loss of our queens? Thanks. Well, Russ, there are a lot of conspiracy theories about queen losses and poorly mated queens out there at the moment, but it all sounds rather unlucky in your case. But I have heard of queens simply going missing this season for no apparent reason. They just seem to disappear. I've had a similar situation with one of my colonies. A new queen has emerged and then disappeared. A few weeks later, an introduced queen disappeared, yet there were no eggs or brood in that colony at any time. I then put in a new introduced queen and she's also disappeared. So actually I've given up with this colony and have combined it with another much stronger colony, turning it into a double brood colony to overwinter. It may well be that there was an unmated queen wandering around in there, but I couldn't see her. But the stronger colony has rectified that situation and they're now ready to head into the winter. Next spring, I'll probably split them down again and start over. Graeme Cox has a couple of questions about honey sales and pricing. Hi Stuart, a very pertinent question for this time of the year. I filled and labelled my 8 ounce hexagonal jars. Question 1. Is it illegal to fill them almost to the top, thereby selling more than the stated weight? Well hi Graeme, uh, well done for getting your crop extracted and into jars. And no, it's not illegal to put too much honey into your jars, but why would you want to do that anyway? It's hard enough to produce at the best of times without giving extra away. Honey can be sold in any weight you desire as long as it's labelled correctly. If you've managed to get an extra ounce into the jar, I would label it accordingly, or else just put eight ounces in it. Question two from Graham. The same jars are going to be sold by my local caravan park in their on-site shop. I want to charge five pounds. What percentage would I discount them by to sell to them? Or is there another accepted way that one deals with potential retailers? Thanks, Graham. Well, depending on the relationship you have with the on-site shop, I would turn the situation around and decide what price you want to sell the honey to to the retailer and let them sort out their retail price. They probably know their customer base best and will know what price they can sell it for. Fix a price for wholesale honey and let the retailer deal with their margins. Also, location is everything. Prices vary so much around the UK, it's difficult to know what the best price is. All I know is that it takes a lot of effort to produce a few jars of honey, and you definitely shouldn't give it away. Apart, of course, to your very closest friends, and then only maybe. Ian Haslam's question is up next. Ian says, Hi Stuart, having put the wet supers back on over crime boards to be cleaned, some colonies are huge and need space. When I remove these supers next week, I plan to place a fresh brood box with foundation and a miller feeder on top, the aim being to utilise the excess bees and get some new comb drawn for next year. Is this a good idea or flawed? Also, can I use Apigard at the same time, using an eek? Cheers and thanks for the videos. I always stop what I'm doing to watch them. Ian. Well, hi Ian, thanks for that. And I would... Get the Apigard on as soon as possible and feed after. I think the Apigard treatment is designed for the bees to clean away the gel and therefore move the thymol vapours around with them. Feeding might cause a distraction and them then ignoring the Apigard. As far as getting another brood box of comb drawn, you might find the bees struggle to draw it all out in time, although with the current spell of fine weather, you might just get a full box drawn successfully. I tend to stop asking the bees to draw comb through August, rather focusing on treating the bees and getting them fed during September. An alternative option might be to use one of the supers already drawn as additional space and allow the bees to fill this with syrup for their winter needs. Locally, you might find you have the conditions, plenty of bees and resources to get a brood box fully drawn, so if you do go ahead with it, do let me know how you get on. Neil Turner's question is next and he says I started beekeeping this year now with three hives and have successfully navigated my first harvest. Where I learned bee theory and practical the default setup was brood and a half which I dutifully followed. Now that I'm reading about how to overwinter I'm realising that I'm possibly in the minority and most folk seem to stick with a brood box and may leave a super on or under for the winter 
but separated from the brood with the queen excluder. My question is, should I stick with brood and a half, which does seem more time consuming and fiddly, but may result in a more robust colony? And bonus question is, if I go just brood, how to leave the existing super with the brood box this winter? Should it be on or under? Queen excluder or no queen excluder? Well, hi, Neil. Thanks for the question. There's nothing wrong with a brood and a half setup, and we all tend to follow the way we were shown when we first get started. As you say, it can be a bit fiddly, and as your beekeeping experience develops, you might well decide to switch to a different setup. I would suggest now is not the time to make that change, though, and I would continue to overwinter them on a brood and a half and review it in the spring. Whichever way you go, though, make sure you remove the queen excluder. My preference is to under super, that is to say, place the super on the floor and the brood box on top of the super. It lifts the brood nest away from the open mesh floor and any drafts that may circulate around the floor. Steve Golpin has a couple of questions. Following on from Neil, I work a few of my hives on brood and a half, with super on top for summer, moving super to bottom for winter. When would you suggest moving super under brood? And my second question, when inspecting a few of the hives yesterday that I fed, I noticed little room left for the queen to lay. Can you overfeed syrup or will bees stop and leave space for the queen to lay winter bees? Thanks. Hi Steve and a great follow on question to Neil's. I touched on the overfeeding earlier, but let's look at your first question regarding when to move the super beneath the brood box. You'll probably notice the bees are bringing in a lot of propolis at the moment. They're getting themselves set for winter by sealing all the cracks and crevices. Making the shift too late in the season will crack these spaces wide open and with the temperatures on the cool side, somewhat cooler than the 30 degrees of heat that we've been having, it will be difficult for the bees to rework and seal those gaps. I make the switch at the point I start feeding, so this will happen in the next week. My reason being, it gives the bees time to seal between the floor and the super and the super and the brood box. Any inspections I feel I need to make can then be made straight into the brood box and not involve lifting off the super first, and I can be quickly into the hive and close it down again on cooler days. Overfeeding is a problem, and as I mentioned earlier, reduced laying space now results in fewer bees to overwinter. I don't start feeding for winter until early September with the aim of disrupting the storage of any ivy nectar and hopefully making it an easier mix for the bees to access in the coming months. I do hope that helps. And our final question comes from Steve Hancock who asks, is it too late to introduce a frame of brood in all stages into a queenless hive and should they be fed syrup? Well hi Steve, it's certainly getting late. We have fewer drones around for successful mating and I would be concerned about queens may be failing and becoming drone layers through the winter. It's been difficult enough, it seems, this summer. If you have no other option, then yes, do it and give them a little feed and cross your fingers. But remember, you're looking at up to 16 days for the queen to emerge, another week or two to mate, so it could well be early October before you know the outcome. My preference at this time of the year is to unite colonies and split in the spring. It gives them a much better chance of overwintering successfully and a bigger colony that can be split in the following spring. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you found those answers interesting and of use. Don't forget you can catch up with more of my beekeeping journey by checking out the continually growing content list on my Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com forward slash Norfolk Honey. I hope you have a great beekeeping week and thanks for hanging around until the end of the podcast. I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping, short and sweet. Yeah.